everyone. My name is Vivian Frosto, and I am an events and programs manager at the Seattle Chamber. I'm excited today to bring you our executive speaker series. Today, we are bringing together and recording with three experts in the field. Um, we will be talking about the region's outdoor recreation industry. Um, including the successes, challenges, and opportunities our, our leaders have seen in recent years. Um, before we dive in, I would like to thank our sponsors, Advanced Professionals Insurance and Benefits Solution, as well as Business Health Trust. And I do have a short video here to get us started from Mailing Slaughter of Advanced Professionals. Hi, my name is Mei Ling Slaughter, and I'm with Advanced Professionals Insurance and Benefit Solutions. Our practice is the Wholesale Benefits Division of Newfront, a growing insurance brokerage that is located right down the street from the Seattle Chamber offices. Our division works specifically with small businesses, providing employee benefits through associations such as the Seattle Chamber. Through this unique partnership, Seattle Chamber members have access to robust and affordable health insurance through a program called Business Health Trust. Whether you have two employees or more than 100, Business Health Trust can help you create a benefits program that attracts talent and keeps your employees healthy and productive at a budget you can afford. Business Health Trust offers exclusive choices from major regional carriers, including Premier Blue Cross and Kaiser Permanente, and we offer employee benefits that go beyond health insurance, such as a 401k and other retirement resources, an employee discount program through Passport Corporate, and HR benefits through Archbright. If you'd like to learn more about Business Health Trust, please visit businesshealthtrust.com. Thank you for your time and to enjoy today's executive speaker series. All right, thank you again to our sponsors, Advanced Professionals Insurance and Benefits Solution, as well as the Business Health Trust for their support in the Chamber's programming. See, and with that, I will dive right in and share our leaders and panelists on outdoor recreation. You are all welcome to turn your video on now. Um, I want to say thank you all so much for joining us today. I'm very excited for this conversation. I know that outdoor recreation is also very near and, near and dear to many hearts in Washington. Um, I will begin by introducing Mark Bereka. Um, Mark is the Director of Community Advocacy and Impact at Recreational Equipment Inc. You may know them as REI. He's also the President of the REI Cooperative Action Fund. Um, Mark has overseen REI's government affairs and community investment for over a decade. And REI is a national outdoor retail cooperative with over 20 million members and annual sales um, approaching $4 billion. The co-op's mission is to connect people from all backgrounds to the power of the outdoors and engage them in the fight to protect it. In the advocacy realm, Mark guides the co-op's engagement in federal, state, and local issues on many fronts, from combating climate change to advocating on matters that affect retailers, such as Main Street business regulation and international trade. Mark also helped found and serves as president for a new public charity, the REI Cooperative Action Fund. And before joining REI, um, Mr. Breka served as technology policy advisor to then Secretary Gary Locke at the US Department of Commerce. He holds a JD from Georgetown University and a BA from Princeton. Welcome, Mark. And next up, we have Ed Bronston. He is the executive director for of the Outdoors for All Foundation, a Seattle-based nonprofit founded in 1979 that is dedicated to enriching the quality of life for children and adults with disabilities through outdoor recreation. In fact, thousands of children and adults with disabilities exercise their abilities with the foundation, thanks to hundreds of volunteers and many donors. Nationally, Ed serves on the board of directors of Move United, an association of, of over 200 adaptive sport organizations across the country. And internationally, he volunteers with Blesma, the Limbless Veterans, and locally, he volunteers with the University Sunrise Rotary Club of Seattle. Ed is a graduate of the University of Washington. Thanks for joining us, Ed. Yeah. 
Last but not least, we have Daisy Katagi, the Interim Recreation Division Director of Seattle Parks and Recreation. Um, Daisy brings over 25 years of experience working at the City of Seattle. She also serves on the Board of Directors for Schools Out Washington, a nonprofit organization. Other affiliations of Daisy's include Leadership Tomorrow and City Leadership Academy. Her educational background includes an Executive Master of Public Administration from the University of, Wa of Washington Evans School of Public Policy and Governance. Um, and with that, I will stop my screen share and pass this over to Daisy, who will be facilitating and joining our conversation today. Um, she will provide us a bit of an, of an overview of the outdoor recreation industry um, throughout the region, and she will kick off our panel by telling us a bit more about Seattle Parks and Recreation um, and how they fit into the industry's, the industry's ecosystem. Thank you so much, Daisy. Thank you, Vivian. Again, my name is Daisy Gatagi. I use she, her, her pronouns. And again, I am with Seattle Parks and Recreation. Um, you know, I'm really excited to be here today. Outdoor recreation is really dear to my heart. Um, I think what we all are learning as we're coming out of this pandemic is how much outdoor is just a respite to us as beings and to the community. I am someone who was born and raised from Seattle, so I know and I am grateful of the land and the resources we have near to us. I understand the access we have to mountains and water and to trees. And so with that being said, we have a variety of different outdoor activities that we have just in our own home. And so that's super exciting. When I think about activities that we all take in part in, you know, outdoor recreation connects through hiking, snowboarding, kayaking, swimming. Other examples of these things are youth and adult sports, whether it's recreational or organized, from camping to pickleball to golfing, and overall just walking. It's, it's just something that's all dear to everything that we all do on, um, for people who are on this call. Um, I think the other thing I also just want to highlight is when you think about outdoor recreation, it's also a space just for families and people to connect. It's a space for us to connect with nature and to just connect with one, which I think is super important. Um, today's discussion, you know, we have the opportunity here from community and business leaders that represent a unique industry that have a touch point with outdoor recreation. We'll have the opportunity to hear successes, challenges, and opportunities that we're facing in our sectors, and to hear more about how we're managing through the pandemic and how we're approaching recovery. I'm going to go back and just start off and share a little bit more about Seattle Parks and Recreation, sharing our vision and mission. Parks and Recreation provides welcoming and safe opportunities to play, learn, contemplate, and build community, and promotes responsible stewardship of the land. We promote healthy people, healthy environment, and strong communities. Fun facts about Seattle Parks and Recreation, we manage about 6,441 acres of park systems of over 489 parks, which includes intensive natural areas. Parks and Recreation provides athletic fields, tennis courts, play areas, specialty gardens, and more than 25 miles of boulevards and 120 miles of trails. The system comprises about 12% of the city's land area. We also manage many facilities, which I hope most people on this call know, which includes 24 community centers, eight indoor swimming pools, two outdoor swimming summer pools, which also includes three environmental education learning centers, two small crafts, and four golf courses, and of course, an outdoor stadium. So much more. Um, so I, again, am grateful to have this opportunity. At this time, I'd like to pass it off to my other humble speakers on the call, and I'd like to pass it off to Ed. If you could please describe your organization and how it fits into the Seattle Outdoor Recreation Ecosystem. Thank you very much, Daisy. Um, uh, Outdoors for All began right here in Seattle. Um, it started in 1979 to make sure that kids with disabilities could learn to go skiing. Too often they were being left behind and they didn't have the same opportunities that kids without disabilities might have taken for granted. Um, here in the Northwest, as we deliver year-round outdoor recreation programs for kids and adults with disabilities, 
our quick fun facts for us, oldest participant ever in our program, 101. Uh, he uh, was a veteran of the world of World War II, and he was rock climbing and about 18 feet up on a rock climbing wall after losing his sight. Uh, youngest participants typically are age five, so it's as young as age five and all ages, all disabilities. It's all about getting people out and active. I think in the last two years especially, we have felt more socially isolated. We have been looking for ways to stay fit, and we've been ways looking for ways to, to foster our own mental well-being. And being able to do that in the community with other groups is very much what Outdoors for All does. When we're doing uh, talks like this, even without the shameless promotion for REI, uh, commonly what we'll do is what people will say, well, what, uh, what activities do you offer? And I say, do you ever shop at REI? Heads nod. And we say, well, that's what we offer. We don't sell the equipment, but we make sure those activities are accessible to people with disabilities. And then speaking to collaboration, our main branch headquarters is uh, based in a Seattle park, Magnuson Park in North Seattle, right on Lake Washington, right across the street from the Burke Gilman Trail and a mile and a half from Seattle Children's Hospital. So we started with collaboration with the ski resort back in 1979. We work with over 100 partners a year to make sure that the outdoors are accessible to people of all abilities. Thank you, Ed. I'll pass the mic over to Mark. Uh, thank you, Daisy, and thank you, Ed. Um, Mark Bereka with REI Co-op, uh, as was mentioned, I have the privilege of uh, serving as the co-op's lead for our, our government relations as well as for our philanthropy. And uh, I, I do emphasize that it's a privilege because uh, the, the co-op was, was born in Seattle uh, in 1938 uh, at, and, and very much uh, deliberately as a co-op. It was uh, brought together by 23 uh, hikers and climbers who decided that uh, collectively they wanted access to uh, better gear at an affordable price. Uh, and the best way to do that was to import it from Europe and uh, share in the, share in the, the, the benefits of a, a bigger purchasing uh, at a reasonable price. Uh, fast forward by 84 years and we're substantially bigger um, and we've got a great reputation um, that great reputation born and, and raised in Seattle. Uh, but honestly, we, we remain um, a modest sized business by retail standards. Um, we are approaching 4 billion in sales. Uh, I like to remind Seattleites that uh, that's probably one day of sales for Amazon, for example. Uh, but in any event, we, we relish our place in the outdoor sector. Uh, and in particular, our roots in the Puget Sound area. Um, I don't know if I have uh, figures off the top of my head specifically for the number of REI co-op members in Seattle, uh, but I do know that out of our 20 million uh, nationwide co-op members, we have 1.5 million members in Washington state. So Washingtonians love the outdoors and we love uh, the opportunity to be uh, a, a provider of gear and apparel uh, to those people as well as across the nation. I'd also just, you know, from my own perspective, but share with you if, if you happen to be a co-op member, um, emphasize that we give back. As a co-op, our mission is aligned with the interests of our members. I like to say that we're not a profit maximizer, we're a profit optimizer so we can stay in business. And as a profit optimizer, uh, we emphasize reinvesting in the communities where we do business and in communities where we'd like to see outdoor recreation become uh, more readily available. Um, we provide grants to over 400 organizations across the country every year uh, to the tune of over $8 million per year. Uh, and then, uh, as indicated previously, we also engage in the advocacy uh, before government because we need these two um, complementary disciplines to come together to increase access to the outdoors. We need the leaders in the not-for-profit community like Ed uh, to be continually uh, uh, engaged in community and creating opportunity and ideas for more opportunity. But government, um, you know, as, as Daisy knows, comes in with the resources to create, to create infrastructure, to maintain infrastructure. So uh, we're super proud to be a contributor to that dynamic 
of supporting the not-for-profit community, as well as working with government to make outdoors more readily available for everybody. Thank you for that, Mark. Can you speak a little bit about what impacts your organization has seen over the last two years due to COVID? Uh, sure, I'll take that uh, first. Am I muted? I'm sorry. Um, no, I guess not, sorry. Um, you know, Ed mentioned this, um, Vivian mentioned this, Daisy, you mentioned this at the outset. I mean, we know that COVID um, isolated people at first, but then enabled them to find themselves and find others, and in large measure, find themselves and find others by spending time outside. Um, and so <clears throat> it's, it's a unique time because if I reflect on sort of the consciousness of government writ large, for example, prior to the pandemic, you could say that many of our um, decision makers, many, many of our budget writers saw time outside as an amenity or a nice to have. But I think the pandemic has demonstrated that it's a necessity, it's a must have. And so there's this new consciousness uh, about the importance of, of spending time outside and connecting in nature, either on your own or with, with family and friends. And um, yes, we've seen uh, increased sales at REI uh, as a result of Spike, um, but we also see that um, present day, things are returning to somewhat of a, a, a new normal as people uh, go back to restaurants and movie theaters and such. And so I think the challenge is how do we capture the magic, if you will, of rediscovering the outdoors during the pandemic and make it more of a, a permanent state for, for uh, all of us. Yeah, I agree. I am also experiencing that on the parks and recreation and in, in, in a sense of um, trying to find ways, not only physically, but also just socially and emotionally finding programs that could really adapt to what we were learning from, from the COVID experience. Um, I think part of the battle we are also finding in our organization in regards to impacts is just staffing in general. I think right now we're having, um, we're just having to speak where it's a, it's an opportunity for people to find professional growth, an opportunity to bring new people to the field, um, but also it's difficult to recruit and maintain and onboard all of that at the same time. Um, Ed, are there anything other trends you're seeing in this speak? I'd love to hear a little bit more about how impacts in your organization have been seen also as well in the last two years due to COVID. Yeah, it's it's amazing to see. I was you know stating before we started the call a year, two years ago, we shut down everything. We had to. The public health parameters said we could not do anything in person. We didn't know, and there was a great deal of fear. And of course, many people were dying as a result of the pandemic. Now we've learned so much in the last two years, vaccines are working, uh, health protocols are working. And as a result of that, our organization, we're kind of, we talked about, it's basically like all the circuit breakers switched off and now the dimmer switches are coming back online. And thankfully most of them are fully back online. But the, the real social isolation that happened in the early stages, that's still damaging to people's mental health and well-being. And today what we're finding is that being outdoors is not only physically a safe way to be active despite um, circumstances, but it, just what it does for your own uh, physical health, for your mental well-being, and your connections with other people. One of the things I love to do and I'm when I'm talking with folks is, you know, well, what are some of the activities you like? Well, I love downhill skiing. I said, what were some of your favorite activities? Well, I was out with friends and dot, 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 or... Do you remember the feeling when you first learned to ride a bike, how you failed and failed and then eventually got going and were able to do it? Yeah. Did you do it alone? No. It's almost always where we're doing it and sharing it with others. And that's really the magic that we have found at Outdoors for All. We didn't just find people with disabilities and their families who were crying out to be out and active again, but we had so many volunteers who were just saying, we want to give back. When can we give back? And thank goodness we, we've been able to foster those connections again. And and get people out and active. So the, the, the disruptions continue to a degree, but our ability to adjust and be resilient to work through that and make sure that at least we as an organization stay committed to partnerships to make sure people with disabilities have access are profound. And we're gonna keep doing that. So um, uh, that's kind of, that's two years in a nutshell. <laughs> 
<laughs> right. And we're, we're still trying to recover. Yeah, um, no, it's not over. It's not over. Um, you know, I, I think about as um, we're in the state and we are moving towards a path of reopening programs, um, this is going to lead into the next just panel discussion in general, is I'm finding that it's an opportunity for us to reimagine the work, really reimagining what parks and recreation can look like. Um, and as a department, we are in this space where we recognize that programs that we were offering prior to the pandemic, not all of them can proceed the way it was as we're coming out of this. So what are some of the new ways we could evolve, whether that includes like virtual programming, um, whatever that may be, but I'm finding it's an exciting time to really just reimagine what the work can be. So with that being led, the next question is, as we look for, as we look ahead from here, what opportunities do you see for the industry to change? What do you expect to see in the next year or two? And what do you hope to see? And I'm gonna ask if um, Mark, you could start first and then we'll lead into Ed. So, um, you know, the, the past several years, feels like several, maybe it's just two and a half have been, you know, dramatic because of COVID, yes. But there, there, are, other, there are other events that have been uh, profound for America as well. Uh, and, I, and I think of the murder of George Floyd and how it sort of brought to the surface uh, in a very profound way. And I don't mean to just uh, isolate that one instance because there are plenty of instances of, of uh, racial injustice and in, in killings um, uh, that caught headlines over the past couple of years and, and even before. But um, if there was a COVID crisis, I'd say there was also a a crisis of, or a, a moment of racial reckoning. And for the outdoor sector, for the business sector, uh, and in particular for REI Co-op, I, I think it was a moment to, to come to terms with uh, our, our, our non-feasance. Sorry to throw out a legal term, but I started as a lawyer. Non-feasance means, you know, you didn't do anything. You know, maybe you didn't do anything wrong, but you might not have done anything right either. You might have uh, perpetuated structural racism, to be blunt. And so uh, the, the co-op, the sector, I think are uh, more aware of that dynamic than ever before. And so as we, as we come out of the pandemic and we think of what's new, both the, what we want to see and what we're working on, it's about uh, redoubling our efforts to assure that opportunities to access the outdoors um, um, the, the notion of what it means to be outdoors, um, the, the access to physical places, that those map more equitably to the reality of America um, and its diversity uh, than might have been true pre-pandemic. And, um, you know, Ed, I would lean into what it means to be diverse in the outdoors and throw kudos at Outdoors for All and similar organizations because I think equitable access by definition also includes access to people with disability. Yeah, I'm happy to chime in on that and, and, um, and affirm. We have seen a greater emphasis on equity and discussions over equity, rightly so over racial injustice, but disability is also diversity. Um, thankfully, our organization started off with a focus on equity back in 1979, and it's been resolute ever since. Um, the, the big change that I've seen in the industry is a, a better appreciation for that. I think, Mark, you stated it really well. In some cases, people might have seen the outdoors as an amenity, and now they see it as a necessity. I think that's wise uh, words. At Outdoors for All, in our culture and our values, we've really talked about making sure that it's, it's focused so that anyone with any disability of any age can have access to the outdoors. And that's not easy to do. Sometimes it takes specialized equipment. Um, it definitely can take trying and trying and trying again. It takes the support of sometimes um, you know, facilities or knowledge or experience. It definitely can take the support of friends and family and of staffing and folks who want to help make that kind of thing happen. Thankfully, in our organization, we are well supported by many folks in the community and we're as committed as ever to making sure that the outdoors are accessible to everyone. Um, 
I think in the mix of what we expect in the next year or two is we expect the need to stay flexible. Um, things that we were doing before business practices. If you had said to me three years ago that half of my staff would be working remotely much of the time, I would have thought you're crazy. Uh, and yet today that is working really well for us. Um, what it also has done is create us opportunities to be more engaged in new communities. Yes, of course, if you're gonna teach someone to learn how to sit ski, you gotta be in person to make that kind of thing happen. But our accountant doesn't necessarily need to be based in Seattle. That person can be almost anywhere in the state of Washington. We are finding people wanting to draw together. And that's one of the wonderful things about our organization is that we do have people wanting to still come together. And I think businesses are seeing that as well. But at least in our culture, in our organization, an organization fully committed to making sure people with disabilities have access to the fun and recreational benefits that many people without disabilities might take for granted, we're making that happen. Um, the other thing that I think we're gonna see and expect in the next year or two, or at least hope to see, is a um, We welcome one-to-one -one support for our organization, but what we have found is we're best effective when we are co connecting with other groups. Um, in my background photo here, um, you see Seattle Parks in action, you see the Mountaineers in action, the rock climbing individual. Um, that's at a wall that the Mountaineers put together. Uh, you see us skiing up at, uh, in the Cascade Mountains and we partner and collaborate with two ski resorts. Um, we work with different organizations from military bases to hospitals to businesses, et cetera, because we can't do it alone. And oftentimes it's not just about the connections we might be able to offer for someone with disability, it's what we might be able to do for your employees, uh, whether they have disability or where they may be interested in wanting to volunteer in our program. So I think there's really um, a lot more opportunity for in-kind connections and a great way for groups to be out in that necessity that we value, which is being outdoors. So that's a quick summary of some of the questions, Daisy, you were, you were positing there. Uh, thank you. I, I second all your comments and I think moving forward what I really hope to see also is just an increase of more collaboration with community partners and, and business leaders you know I think there's an opportunity where you know there's subject matter experts that provide the service if platforms like parks and recreation have access to people like there should be a way to work collaboratively to really execute the experience for everyone to have um, another hope I hope to see is just an increase of more youth involvement with outdoor recreation. Um, I think in general, there may be this idea of what outdoor recreation may be um, and being able to just have um, more diversity in some of these sports that, you know, don't know how many people you see have access to skiing and snowboarding, um, different types of activities that you're not typically getting from like a school setting, but what are some ways to really find um, the opportunities to expand that. So that's exciting. So we're gonna lead into the next question, which really is around equity and access. Um, and we kind of spoke about this already. Um, equity and access is an opportunity for underrepresented communities and a crucial piece of our region's economic recovery. How are you including this community and how can this change the industry? It's a- So maybe we, oh, go ahead. Oh. I was going to just jump in because it's just like that's yep. that's what we're about, and I, I thankfully there are a lot of other organizations leaning in in this space too, and being supported uh, in the for-profit world as well. Um, it's interesting for our organization. One of the things we have looked at, particularly in the last year and a half, is uh, the intersectionality of disability and race. It's hard to make sure that people with disabilities have access to the outdoors. It's also hard to make sure people who are traditionally underserved BIPOC are out and active. And so if we're gonna do both of those together, it's gonna to take a lot of work, but it's still worth it. Um, in our space, in our organization, our best means of doing that is making sure that we are reducing barriers to access. Sometimes that's knowledge, sometimes that's cost, sometimes that's physical, where the locations are actually taking place. Um, and one of the ways we do that is, like I said, through collaboration, but also through our mobile fleet of adaptive recreation programs. So uh, this past Sunday, we did a pop-up event in Fremont. We're normally based our headquarters in uh, Northeast Seattle. So we headed off to North Seattle 
uh, brought a trailer full of gear. Uh, we were well supported by U Park Parking. They just made their parking lot free and accessible to us. And we were able to make sure that people who wouldn't have otherwise been able to access us uh, were able to get out and active and try out a sport. Um, behind me is a photo of a, a girl uh, in a pink jacket. Uh, her name is Patricia. We don't see Patricia active in our programs anymore, but that's a fantastic success. And here's why. She was able to access our seven days a week free adaptive cycling center, which the Seattle Department of Transportation and private donors support. It's available with access over to 250 different bikes, hand cycles, side-by-side -side tandems, rec uh, recumbent trikes, standard trikes, therapy trikes. All of those are available for three, seven days a week, May through September because of these kinds of supports. But the reason we don't see Patricia anymore is not because she's not cycling, it's because she now has her own bike. So she was able to come out, try out different activities. I will never forget because as soon as she started pedaling, she just started squealing. She was so excited to be out and active. Uh, Patricia lives with cerebral palsy and uh, now lives up in um, outside the Seattle area. She lives in Bellingham, but she has her own bike. So she can go cycling whenever she wants to. She gets to make those choices when she wants to. And that really supports our vision that people of all abilities should be able to get out and be active in the outdoors whenever and wherever they want to. So um, how that gets focused on equity is making sure that um, organizations like ours and other organizations that are committed to make sure the outdoors are accessible to everyone work together. And I think that's gonna be an increased focus going forward. So I think that's a, a really insightful or, or inspiring um, sort of deep dive into the, the workings of a not-for-profit um, at, at REI as a co-op, but still for-profit, um, we recognize that if if greater equity is where we want to end up, the one of the most important things is to start close to home in our own operations. And so uh, we have uh, an initiative uh, well underway now, racial equity, diversity, and inclusion. It's multi-pronged, but it starts with uh, awareness raising and education uh, within our uh, still predominantly white employee base uh, ab about um, uh, the, the value of diversity in the workplace, uh, the, the importance of of inclusion and an inclusive mindset in all its dimensions. Um, and then uh, I won't go, go over all the facets of, of the initiative, there are so many, but um, it does extend to hiring and understanding uh, that the, the workplace itself needs to evolve if the outdoors is going to evolve. Um, to Ed's point about working remotely, our ability to work more and more remotely means we can fill jobs from around the country um, with people from around the country who might not even uh, relocate to Seattle, but might feel more comfortable uh, staying closer to their original homes. And so um, then it extends to, to the business partners that we make. And we've created a, a fund, Path Ahead Ventures, uh, which is basically a, a venture capital fund uh, so that we can start to help uh, cultivate a, a greater and greater population of gear and apparel companies led by um, uh, thought leaders uh, from different uh, different backgrounds. We, we invest in businesses that are BIPOC led. So it's, it's it, each of these layers, if you will, where we're trying to in, increase the um, consciousness and also the actuality of, of diversity in the outdoors. And then we layer on top of that the work of my group, which is in the philanthropic and the government affairs realm, uh, which is to say, yes, we need to provide uh, seed funding, not just to the um, um, businesses, but also to the not-for-profits that are making the outdoors uh, more accessible and uh, support government agencies and, and government programs that do the same. I guess the, the last piece I'd, I'd share about this uh, uh, widespread initiative is we know that the outdoors, even if it is physically accessible, also has to seem welcoming or, or be welcoming uh, to people of different backgrounds. And, and, and that's a cultural thing uh, in, in, in many respects. 
And to the extent we can make the outdoors um, and the image of the outdoors appear welcoming to all, I think we're also adding to the positive cultural change. And so when you look at REI media, for example, our catalogs, our, our web pages and the like, you'll see that uh, it's, it's not your you know, 1930s Seattle outdoors people. It's uh, more the diversity of America that shows up um, on REI.com and elsewhere. I know one of the programs that we offer through Parks and Recreation is a program where we intentionally do outdoor activation. And what that means is we actually have a mobile program where we actually bring activities to these pocket parks within our city to just activate. We'll just bring games and activities um, to encourage the community to come out, come out and just actively play. Um, to introduce them into the outdoors and to just get them to be outside um, and going to areas that we deem um, as an area that needs access to programs because whether they're in a in a desert zone meaning like you know there isn't that much access to a bus line um, to whatever fashion it may be, but what are what are we doing to eliminate barriers so it's more accessible? And that is an example of some of the things that we're doing. I think some of the other areas we've been trying to do and how we're trying to change the industry is just bringing the programs to the community, such as these open door parks. Um, but we also are trying to be intentional by creating more programs specifically with Seattle Public Schools or um, other fashions to that way where they're just being introduced to whether it's environmental learning, um, to just learning different like leadership skills that pertain to outdoor activities, I think is some innovative ways of how we've been trying to approach this type of work. Um, I think just to add another layer to this discussion, I think one of the items that maybe all three of us can speak a little bit more around is just um, the word safety and public safety. I think with us coming out of the pandemic, we're also realizing how many other audiences we're encountering in regards to like users of our parks and being outdoors. And, you know, it's, it's, it's a real thing, as we all know, that we're encountering a lot of struggles around mental health, um, unsheltered um, people, um, and all these other variables that are just in this space that we're in. Um, I would love to hear a little bit more from Ed and then Mark about just how, how are you guys approaching that work and whether it's something within your staffing structure, um, how you're thinking about protocols and, and operations in regards to how you execute programs. Um, can you speak a little bit more about that? Sure, and um, I know I dropped off for a minute there. Speaking of about uh, skills we need going forward, it's being adaptable and giving grace in the space of virtual connections. Um, I think back to two years ago when we literally shut down our in-person operations for six months. We began our virtual yoga classes and other kinds of programs as soon as we possibly could. But in the early stages of the pandemic, we didn't know what could be done. And so as an example, we started a Bikes to You program, which has continued to a degree today. We started making house calls. And what we did was we took adaptive sports equipment, usually adaptive cycles, so that's the bikes to you side of it. We sanitized all of the gear with spray alcohol so we wouldn't damage the equipment and sports. We got some very good clean chains out of the mix, by the way, and uh, went about uh, delivering adaptive cycles for free to people throughout the region and made sure that they could access the bikes uh, and use them in their, at their own homes. Um, that required that they would have either sidewalks or a park or trail or location that would be nearby that would work or a parking lot or something, but it was really super successful for us. We then learned of other ways to make those kinds of things happen. And of course, as the vaccine became available, in-person safety was a little bit easier for us to manage. But um, we've been focused on safety since we began because we have been taking people who are paralyzed up on chairlifts. Uh, which can be very slippery. <laughs> and we're working to make sure that people, and those folks, by the way, might have paralysis or they might be blind or, you know, it's any disability. And so we have to recognize that our activities have to be, well, I always tell people we're not worried about liability. We're always focused on safety first, fun second, and learning third, which is um, really the right priority mix for us. 
Um, the extra level of safety that has impacted us in the public health arena is just recognizing now, two years ago, yeah, if you had a sniffles, you might still come into the office. Today, no way. You know, we're just really supportive of saying you need to work from home. We'll figure out something else. Um, we put in place a, a process that um, when you got vaccinated, and we required all of our staff to be vaccinated, when you got vaccinated, um, that uh, sick time, if you had any symptoms after being vaccinated, did not come from your regular uh, pool of sick time. Any, any results that you had by going actually to get an appointment, that also came as actual scheduled work time and we paid for that time. So we tried to be as flexible as we possibly could to incent it. Um, thankfully, so many of our staff, we, we had no pushback. Folks said, we wanna make sure not only that we're safe, but we wanna make sure our participants are safe. Because of course, many people with disabilities may have medical conditions that put them in a more uh, exposed um, circumstance where we have to be additionally careful. Uh, so those kinds of things were, were really uh, protocol that just worked. Um, I think the other thing we really learned was, and we've continued to see that is if even with the much more virulent um, cases of COVID with the most recent strains, you're outdoors in fresh air, you're probably not gonna get it. You know, if, if I'm breathing, if I'm at a, a, at a sports event, maybe at a Sounders game or something and I'm right next to you, yeah, it might happen because the air is, is not circulating much. So it's kind of that whole parts per billion connection. And if I'm out on a bike path or I'm kayaking out on the Sound or on Lake Washington, or I'm out uh, on Duthie trails working with recovering veterans to get them out mountain biking or any of the different kinds of activities in the Seattle area, by staying outdoors, our chances of getting ill from the virus at least are next to nil. Um, I might get bonked because I, I uh, I fall and that's why I make sure I'm wearing a helmet. But those kinds of things, I think. Uh, and then there's public safety. There's con some concern certainly with where we're recreating. You know, um, the more people are out and about, the more you have social connections with other people and there's safety in numbers of just having other people being visible with where you are. So I think all of those factors together um, help at least in our operations work that way. I, I'm not sure how that has worked necessarily for REI, but that certainly has worked for Outdoors for All. Uh, I would, I would um, make one observation. I'm, I'm in a Seattle Chamber of Commerce forum, and so uh, done a couple of these uh, types of presentations previously. And I like to sometimes reflect on uh, the fact that REI, we are we are definitely an outdoor company with a mission of connecting everyone to the outdoors, uh, but we're also a retailer. And uh, there is this you know interesting thing about retailers that are are, are born and raised in Seattle. They, they have a very customer-centric point of view, whether it's REI, whether it's Nordstrom, or whether it's a Starbucks, um, Costco, very customer-oriented. Um, and, and so in the height of the, in the early days of the pandemic, it was, uh, like Ed, 110% about the well-being of our customers and the well-being of our employees. And it even meant sh shutting down everything. Uh, uh, precipitously and, and, and trying to fashion a new normal. Um, and, and like Ed's organization, you know, wrote protocols on the fly and um, for separation and for disinfecting, what have you. We also um, saw it as our role as a, a leader in the outdoor sector to, to try to think of ways to shape broader behavior. And I remember getting a phone call from our CEO. Uh, it was probably April, like shutdown was March. It could have been late March or early April. And he said, Mark, we, we really have to help the community more broadly start to uh, come together around what might be new best practices for engaging in the outdoors. And um, we turned to our 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 friends and not-for-profit uh, uh, partners uh, in Washington State and then went even more broadly nationally and we created this organization Recreate Responsibly and, and it still thrives today. It's recreateresponsibly.org uh, and it's, a, it's about, um, you know, in, a, in the time of a pandemic, physical distancing. It's about not overloading places. In fact, look before you go so you don't overload places 
and make places uncomfortable for the individuals or wear down those places. We also evolved the recreate responsibly um, principles to include notions of, you know, recognizing that we're on indigenous lands, um, recognizing that the outdoors should be for all and should be welcoming for all. And so, you know, it's still in some respects early days for this broad notion of recreate responsibly, but, but I do think that that's the touchstone. That's the touchstone for uh, our collective um, behavior in the outdoors. We all have to share this planet. We share these places and, and it's not just for, for us, it's for us and other people who enjoy it today, but, it, and especially for those who we want to have enjoy it uh, tomorrow. So it's about having fun, um, but also having that like that, that filter um, of responsibility as you do it um, every step of the way. Yeah, and I find myself um, recognizing that it's important to encourage like employees and staff to go outside and enjoy outdoor recreation. Like I think what um, the teleworking is creating also is just like, are you being mindful about how long you're sitting and, and being in front of a screen and, you know, creating space for you to be able to just take that break and go outside and just connect and um, get a breath of fresh air is, is also important as well. Um, public safety for parks and recreation has, it, it, it's a variety of different things. I think about right now how um, we are really struggled to think about how we need to pivot in regards to responding to just social and emotional safety um, is, is something we're revisiting at this space now as we're ramping up programs um, and thinking about that in relation to all ages. Um, and I think that was something that we got out of the pandemic is just, you know, as people were getting reintroduced to being in these spaces with um, small, smaller, larger, you know, we're kind of weaning into the sizes, um, how that kind of created um, anxiety for people, you know, and like, how do we create like some, some frameworks so that people can feel safe when they're entering our spaces. And so we've had to revisit some of our protocols and policies around that. Um, and, and that's just, again, another learning we were getting out of the pandemic as well. So, um, the next question I'd like the panel to think about is um, what are just some key factors, kind of like your aha moments, what is it that you'd like to share and you want people to leave from this discussion? What do you want them to take away from, you know, our overall thoughts and experiences, business and community leaders and, and our touch point with outdoor recreation? Um, what, is, what is it that you want people to land and kind of like ponder on when they leave this call? I'm happy to chime in if you want, Daisy. I see yes. equity as opportunity. Um, and I think the idea that it's something we should be doing, yes, in, in some cases it does take a lot more work, but it's so worthwhile. Um, REI started with a small handful of people who wanted to get a good deal and a better deal on gear outdoors for all started as the ski for all foundation because it was focused on equity to make sure that kids with disabilities could have access to the outdoors and learning how to ski. And then years later, more programs were offered and, and expanded over the years. And what we've seen um, over the five decades of our operations and over the last two years is this idea that equity is not just beneficial to the individual that you're providing the service for, it is also beneficial to the person who gets to help provide that service. Um, our mission at Outdoors for All is to enrich the quality of life for children and adults with disabilities throughout our recreation. It's focused on people with disabilities. The motto you'll hear us using in communities is shorter and a little different, and it's transforming lives throughout our recreation. And we use transforming lives throughout our recreation because it acknowledges the reciprocity of service that comes when we are successful at pursuing and delivering on our mission. Because it's not just what it's doing for the participant, it's what it's doing for that family member. It's what it's doing for the volunteer, for the donor, for the community member. This last winter, when we were able to restore so many more of our on-snow programs, if I had a dollar for every time someone from the cheerlet was cheering down to say, go outdoors for all, you know, 
you really saw the community pride that took place by folks, uh, even if they weren't directly involved, indirectly they recognized, hey, that's a really good thing there. Hey, that is someone who is up climbing a rock face on a climbing wall, even though they may have limb difference. Or hey, that is someone who lost sight and is out kayaking on Puget Sound. Um, hey, I've never ridden a bike before. I can't ride a bike. I know friends who have learned to ride a bike and they've fallen and it didn't work. Oh, a recumbent hand cycle? How does that work? Oh, oh, I, I can ride a bike. I just didn't have the right equipment. And then to op open up those kinds of opportunities. It's as close to Harry Potter magic as it gets. And that equity is what we get to be a part of. And it's because we're connected with other groups. Uh, I'm again, gonna be a shameless promoter. We don't get to do what we do without donors and supporters. REI has been a longtime supporter. Seattle Parks and Recreation, we've been recreating in Seattle Parks for decades. And like I said, our main base camp and headquarters is at Magnuson Park. I think we in the Pacific Northwest can see that there are opportunities, not just for equity, but there are ways for us to collaborate and work with others. And, uh, and we're gonna keep doing that. So I know that's what we're gonna lean in towards and, and I see nothing but success coming from that. We'll have some hurdles along the way, but we'll do it together. I'll um, add some more layers on top of Ed's uh, inspiring comments about the multiple benefits of time outdoors, time in nature. Um, in, a, in a different, you know, panel or a different day, we might talk about uh, economics a little bit more deeply. Um, but one of the things that REI has helped to bring to the fore over the past decade is the fact that this sector, the sector of outdoor companies and organizations, um, we're a meaningful part of the US economy. Uh, federal government studies demonstrate that it's more than 2% of GDP which is more than mining and extraction, the act of mining and extraction. Um, nationwide, it's over 5 million jobs. In Washington state, it's over 200,000 jobs. Um, and, and so that's, that's another element of outdoor recreation um, and, and it as a necessity, uh, because it, it also is a, a, a good supplier of jobs and also where you have outdoor recreation, you attract other types of businesses. So whether you're in Wenatchee or, um, you, know, um, you know, Bend, Oregon or Leavenworth, um, you know, North Bend, you can, you can pull in other types of businesses because there is a recreation opportunity. So we, we need to recognize that benefit as well. But I, I'll come back to what, where Ed was going and, and Daisy, you started with this when you said that the outdoors is you know, good for our well-being, it's good for our communities, it's good for our planet. The way I um, try to capture that very same thought, uh, but with, with a, a little like, rhyme is the wrong word, but a little bit of a, a acronym, if you will, um, or a, a mnemonic. I talk about how the outdoors delivers against the health of our people, the health of our places, our communities, and the health of our planet. Plus it generates jobs. Like if, if you have a sector of American society where you're, you're driving health benefits for us individually as people, driving benefits for us as communities, as places, and driving benefits for the planet and contributing to, to economic well-being, then that is a necessity. Uh, it's not a, an amenity, it's a must have, not a nice to have. And so I'm hoping that through the pandemic, there's been greater consciousness of, of this opportunity of this and, and that we seize the moment and, and integrate the outdoors more into all of our lives. Um, so that, um, you know, frankly, Daisy, people who work in, in parks don't feel like they've got a scrap for the next, you know, uh, set of budget dollars up to, for, for maintenance, but rather we've proven the case that parks are essential. And, and it's not a second thought, it's a first thought. Yes, I appreciate that. Thank you, Mark. And thank you, Ed, for your comments. It's been a pleasure being on this call with the both of you and knowing that I'm amongst people that understand the value of just outdoors and the benefits of what, of what it brings. 
you know, healthy communities, healthy people in general, and just stronger communities, right? It, it all of it is something that braids into all of us, and it's free. It's accessible to everyone. Um, so how are you capitalizing off of that? Um, so with that said, I'd like to pass it back to uh, Vivian. Yeah, thank you all so much for being part of this discussion, Daisy, Mark, and Ed. Um, I know that I have learned a lot <laughs> just from sitting in, and I'm sure our audience will as well. It's great to hear that you know you have all been collaborating on the back end, um, and it sounds like. You know, obviously the outdoor industry isn't going anywhere. It's here to stay in Washington. And um, it sounds like there's a push towards inclusivity um, and we are going great places. So thank you so much for being involved. I do want to take one last second to um, thank our sponsors for support, supporting the Chamber's programming. Um, thank you, Advanced Professionals and Business Health Trust. And I would also like to give one last plug to the Seattle Chamber. If you enjoyed today's program and you want to be more involved, you can visit our website at seattlechamber.com to become a member or check out our upcoming events this fall. I say thank you again to our panelists for joining. And thank you all online for watching. Um, we will see you soon. Thank you.